Thanks again for coming. I'm just going to let you know who you have up here to ask questions of before we get them going. So you have met Jesse and Julia and their amazing accomplishments already. Ben as well here on the end. Next to Ben is Finn Bailey. Finn's the youngest member of our team. He, Finn has uh, been on the U18 championship trip for the U.S. several times and last year was fourth and sixth at that event in Finland. Lauren, next to Finn here, um, Lauren has, last year she started 15 World Cup races and got her first top 30. She won a super tour and was on the podium at US National. And then Lena is next to Lauren and Jesse. and Lena is a NCAA All-American multiple times. She was on the podium at the NCAA National Championship. Last year, she was top 15 in several super tours, and she's been working super hard and hoping for more. So, the questions, should we start? Do you have some questions? Matt's collected some questions. I'm gonna... A couple. So if you have questions, raise your hand. And there's to incentivize you to ask questions, there might be some product that just gets tossed out. Think really hard. Yeah. Some of it's pretty nice, too. Um, before we get there, I just want to say one little thing. Remember, this was a this is a free event, right? So thank you, thank you again to the Memory Clinic for hosting all of us. But also, what I think they would want me to say is there are envelopes that are kicking around with the SMST2 um, address on it. If you want to take one home and write a check, send it in. They're, self, they're already stamped, ready to go. Like, please support this, these fine people. Like I said, they're our local team, and we should be supporting them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just because Matt already went down that road, I also would love to invite you to sign up for our newsletter so that you can find out what the athletes are up to and what their race results in the winter look like. So it's smseliteteam.wordpress.com, I think is our, our website. And there's a red button that says subscribe to the newsletter. In addition to those envelopes, there's a, a Venmo handle that you can use to send donations to the team and uh, you can follow us on social media as well. So we love to keep you all in the loop. Okay. Great. Do you want, do you want to just yeah. Hello. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> How do you guys approach injuries that you have to like take time off for? <laughs> you guys want to pass that one? Yeah, yeah. Joe, anyone down there want to talk about it? You How start. do you approach injuries? How do you approach injuries? Um, that is a great question. There, <laughs> um, there are so many ways to approach injuries. I think it's it's such a loaded question because you know, as Julia and Jesse both mentioned, there's like a variety of injuries that you can have. But I guess for myself personally, I've had um, back surgery, ankle surgery three years ago, and so how I approach that was really focusing on the small little wins. So like Julia kind of mentioned this, but really breaking your, your injury process into, or like recovery process into like, okay, in two weeks I get to do this, in three weeks I get to do this. And I think having these little goals along the way, the process goals that Ben mentioned, makes the entirety of coming back to sport and coming back to the things you love feel really attainable. And so I would really like, I think the best thing to do is to try and, and break it into little goals along the way, but, and recognize that it's really hard to like being injured and taking away the things that maybe you love the most, whether it's, you know, running or just being outside. It, it's really, can be really mentally hard and making sure you have a really good support system to help you in those ways that you need. And then my other thing that I think is, is really important is, um, like Julia had also mentioned, that sometimes you find a new, a silver lining with, with this injury or whatever it may be, that maybe you weren't going to no pole skate for three months straight, or maybe you weren't going to be in a pool for 
for two months aqua jogging um, and all of a sudden you're a really good skate skier because you had to do it with no poles and you're really efficient at skating with no poles now or with with poles once you get to use them after three months of no poles so I would definitely like oh, find those silver linings they can be hard in the moment but breaking it up into little things helps a lot Cool. Thank you. Uh, so this is May's question. She's seven years old and she'd like to know how you go so fast. <laughs> uh, we definitely, it takes a lot of practice. Um, but we start, you know, going slow. We do, we actually, we go slow a lot and that helps you go fast. Uh, <laughs> Don't need to get too deep in the training philosophy, but um, it's basically, yeah, you know, you, if you do something at any speed and then eventually you'll be able to go, go fast, just like, uh, yeah, running or skiing or anything. Um, but yeah, also we, uh, really like doing it, which helps. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Any others out there? Oh, and that is an awesome piece of Solomon stuff. Oh, one right here. Let's bring this out. We got a mic right here. Oh, sorry. Hold that thought. Um, at one, at like, what point in your life did you know you wanted to make cross country skiing like your career and spend the rest of your life doing it? Pass it down the line. Yeah, we'll pass it down the line. They're like everyone. Oh, everybody. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Like what age? Um, at what point in my career or in my life? Well. It's a great question. I think it, I'm not sure I can really put my finger on exactly when it was, but um, <clears throat> you know, at some point along the way, like Julia mentioned, a lot of us did a bunch of sports when we were young. I actually just ran into my uh, middle school lacrosse coach here, which was awesome. Who's that? Um, <laughs> coach Sands. Hopefully he's still here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, there he is. What a guy. I was, uh, anyhow. That was awesome. But yeah, you know, at some point, um, you, yeah, you kind of, see what you like and what you don't like. And for me, it was in high school, you know, my lacrosse and soccer efforts sort of fizzled out after freshman year. And uh, I realized that I just like, I don't know, I like the endurance stuff and I like kind of, yeah, being, trying to get, I don't know. Yeah, the, the individual sport has its perks. So yeah, for me, it was in high school, but yeah, it's kind of a moving target for sure. How about you, Finn? Um, I've been skiing my whole life. I actually started off as a, alpine racer as well as nordic skiing too but it was in high school for me too that i pretty much settled on nordic when i started going to sms and i played soccer and baseball throughout my whole career at sms and still chose nordic skiing in the end <laughs> but yeah i would say it was in high school really yeah. um I grew up with an older sister, uh, I was about five years older than me, and I think I went to go watch her at Junior Nationals, and Jesse was probably racing there, but I remember it, it was um, in Anchorage, and the Keegan Randall, like, Keek Animal Subaru car was in the parking lot, and I was like, that is a cool car, <laughs> and I think I want to do that, and I'm going to try really hard to do that. <laughs> Come on, pink car. <laughs> Um, same as Ben and Finn, I was in high school when I decided that I really wanted to give ready skiing a go. So, I was a high school girly. Same. I think when I was like 16, I went over to represent the U.S. internationally and saw how big it was over there. And it blew my mind. There were people with like flares and chainsaws on the side of the on no blades on the chainsaw but i was like this is so cool how can this be my job i need to make this my job yeah i alluded to it earlier i went to estonia when i was 14 and there was a marathon race with probably i'm not joking 40 tracks 40 classic tracks next to each other for the start line i was like wow this is big over here and we're gonna make it big in the u.s after minneapolis this year oh, yeah. <laughs> How do you guys reach your goals so well? 
<laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think for every goal that you see, there are, are there are other goals that we actually didn't reach that we're still working towards. And so sometimes it can be really easy on the outside to be like, oh, that person, they have everything or they accomplished everything. But sometimes what you don't know is that there's goals that we're still working towards. I would still like to enjoy classic skiing more personally. <laughs> it's, gonna it's gonna happen someday. So there's there's definitely goals that we're still working towards. And I think uh, like Ben was talking about with the process goals and the outcome goals, the way we reach those outcome goals isn't by thinking, I wanna win a gold medal at the Olympics. If you think about that all the time, it won't just appear. But if you think about, I'm going to show up and be with my team, and I'm going to do the best that I can do today, and then tomorrow, I'm going to show up and I'm going to be, do the best that I can do tomorrow, and then the day after that. And your best might not always be like, I'm the fastest in the whole world today. Sometimes your best is just what you have in that moment, and that's okay too. But just putting together day after day of doing the best that you can do, that's how we end up reaching most of the goals. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I lost my voice, so this might really help. It's like week four of my voice. Um, I appreciate that you guys share about the mental fortitude um, and the mental health aspect of all of this. Um, what do you guys do from the day to day? for mental fitness, like we know a lot about practice and all these things. Do you have a counselor or some methods you're engaged in regularly that help you? Not just when you're now down and out, laid up in the bed. Yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, because we do a lot with our mental health um, to work on that just as much as our physical health. Um, and I think all of us here um, see a sports psych um, and that is a huge part of our skiing and what goes into our ski career. Um, but like Jesse was talking about, you, you know, you got to take care of the things that you don't always see and, um, taking care of your mind and how you are handling nerves or, um, uh, stressful situations around racing. Um, seeing sports like is really helpful, um, for all of us. And the other thing I would elaborate on too is like debriefing after an event. So um, I debrief with my sports psych every week <laughs> in the summer, but also after every single race, I fill out this whole evaluation of like, how was I doing mentally during this race? How did I tackle my goals? How do I feel about it? If I could go back, what would I change? And we've compiled literally a decade of data. So now it's kind of fun because when I show up in Ruka, Finland, I look back at the last 10 years of doing 10 Ks on those trails and I'm like, aha, <laughs> these are things that I would change uh, over the ten, last 10 years and then I can see how I change them, have I not? Am I writing the same thing every year? Maybe it's time to tackle that. And so um, it's also this process of writing it down and then being able to look back. And so sometimes it feels like, wow, I'm not progressing, I'm not growing. But when you look back at what you wrote in your own words, then you can say, wow, I have grown. Maybe I, it doesn't feel like it in the moment, but wow, when I look back, like I have improved on this. How do you mentally prepare for a race? take this one um i really like to visualize and that's also sports psych work or psych work um i like to go through different scenarios and what i want to be thinking about on different parts of the course and so you know i can't maybe control like what the people around me are doing but i can control what i'm thinking about on certain parts and so i think okay on this hill i really want to work on this aspect of my technique. And on this part, I know it's really gonna hurt and it's gonna be deep in the pain cave. So I'll just tell myself, just keep swimming. <laughs> I can do it. Um, and so for me, I like to visualize how I wanna execute the race. Sometimes I visualize things going wrong and how I wanna handle that. And so I might not be physically out there training, but I'm training my mind and having different paths of decision-making 
Um, and the other way I mentally prepare is by having fun. Jesse and I like to have dance parties, or Lauren and I make TikToks, <laughs> or you know, I play games with friends, or just call my family and socialize with them. And so keeping things focused but fun. Who was that? Yeah, who was it? It's in the purple shirt. Oh, purple okay. shirt. What is your, what do you think is the most effective cross training sport? Cross training sport. I mean, roller skiing is the like most, it imitates cross country skiing the most, but I think it really depends on what your strengths and weaknesses are. My answer would be every sport. <laughs> surfing. <laughs> yeah, surfing. Um, I yeah, I think whatever uh, will get you out the door and get you focused. So for me, probably roller skiing is probably the most effective. But I also happen to really like it, despite all the scars. Yeah, we do a lot of running and biking um, and swimming as cross training um, the whole summer and fall leading up into the ski season. Um, so we definitely keep ourselves busy with a lot of other <laughs> sports. My other thing would just be like making sure there's some strength training, um, especially for injury prevention. It's like a strong core, I think is very important for that cross training aspect, but whatever makes you happy, whatever makes you enjoy being outside and getting your heart rate up. Uh, when you guys are on the trails, what kind of things do you do to prepare for the race? When we aren't on the trails? Yeah. Sleep. Eat. <laughs> <laughs> and training. But we've talked about all those things. So uh, what else do we do? We prepare our minds. We've talked about that. Um, you got the kendama. We kendama. play with the kendama sometimes. Um, that's embarrassing, though. Um, yeah, I don't know. What else? Body Anything care? Else? Oh, what? body. Like, like stretching, oh, foam rolling? Definitely. Yeah, we stretch sometimes. Uh, <laughs> not always. Sometimes you get hurt. But uh, we also sometimes go to PT and have oh, them, massage. like, give you a massage or, you know, work on your sore muscles, which can be a nice way to get the same benefits of stretching without actually having to stretch. Um, <laughs> that works great. Hydrate. Hydrate is a big one, definitely. It goes along with stretching. Um, yeah, all kinds of stuff, really. But um, whatever sort of, yeah, and if, and if we're feeling nervous, we do nothing related to s the skiing, you know? We just try and read a book or look at our Instagram, YouTube, <laughs> learn about something. Yeah, there's all kinds of options. <laughs> so, yeah, great question, though. Um, so because skiing can be like, like it's, there's a lot with like times and places, like how do you find a balance between like finding success not in the like time and place because like, yeah, when you're talking about your progress goals, like how do you find a balance between like defining success around hitting those progress goals even if the big goal like, 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 like you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like <laughs> instead of focusing so much on the, like your place or your time and instead on like, the little victories you've had along the way? Oh, Definitely a fantastic question, and one of the big challenges of uh, being an athlete, for sure, because there's always that result sheet, and the result sheet gives you a nice, concise ranking, and uh, sometimes that works out in your favor, and other times it doesn't, and you gotta be, you know, you gotta be prepared for, for e each scenario, so, you guys wanna, yeah. I can. yeah. Um, I'm not a big results person. <laughs> um, and I think that it's been really healthy for me to just think a lot about like how I skied. Um, did I ski the course the way I mentally visualized that I wanted to do? Like did I execute on what I my plan was and try to like be really proud with my effort and how I battled mentally and physically out there and if a result follows that's so awesome. But if a result didn't follow, that's okay. I can I can definitely learn from that experience but i think i have like really focused on having fun while racing and then like trying to be like wow i, I skied this section really well or i did this really well or like i'm really proud of this and then i can work on this here and like kind of focus more on that than just like a, a number on a sheet um that's kind of how i try to I yeah, okay. yeah i i have a quick story for you to follow that up um 
like five days before we won the gold medal at the 2018 Olympics, I had one of the best races of my entire life. And I missed out on a medal by 3.3 seconds in a 10 kilometer race. And at the end of that race, I couldn't feel my legs from the waist down. I could barely breathe. My vision had tinted pink because I was pushing myself probably too hard. It was probably not good for me, actually. <laughs> Thinking about now that I'm saying that out loud, it's terrible. <laughs> However, I had pushed myself so hard and I had executed one of the best races of my entire life. And laying there in the snow before I looked at the results, I made myself think back and I was like, that was that was it. That was everything I had. And then I got up off the snow and saw that it was so close to tying with Mara Bjorgen and Krista Parmakoski for a medal. And I had to go through the media zone and have an hour of people saying, I'm so sorry. Can you tell me how disappointed you must be? And I said, I'm not sorry. Don't be sorry for me. This was the best race of my life. And so I had to really separate how I felt about my effort and what was within my control and what the results sheet said. And so it was really, really important for me to identify with how I felt first. So one rule I have for myself is when I'm laying there in the snow gasping for air, that's the moment when I decide how I felt about the race. And I have to decide that before I get up and look at the results because I have to know before I let something else tell me or anybody else tell me. So that's a really important tool. Okay, this question, this question could be for any of you, I guess. The day will come to you, as it does for any world-class athlete, when you can no longer compete effectively because you're getting older. But what plans do you have in terms of the future? Will you be planning on keeping skiing as part of your professional career somehow related to skiing? Or will you, do you have goals for going on to other fields but still for recreational purposes, of course, continue skiing. I mean, I'm the, I'm the oldest here, by the way, so I'll make it quick. Um, I do want to keep skiing in my life. My biggest goal is to ski the Berkey like when I'm 80 with my grandkids and dress up in a cool costume. So I'm definitely going to keep it in my life. Um, and I would like to give back to the sport in many ways. So maybe coaching, um, but I'm going to be real flexible. I'm going to stay open to how I want to do it. <laughs> yeah, I can not say something else on that one too. Some of us have also, uh, some of us have also like been in school through skiing, and uh, like I was at the University of Vermont and studied engineering. So when I'm all done skiing, I hope to kind of circle back and try and get a job uh, as an engineer or some and use that in some capacity. So. You know, I think a lot of us have definitely thought about that, and but none of us, I don't think, will ever turn our backs on skiing entirely. <laughs> That's for sure. It'll always be, you know, we'll, we'll be involved in some capacity. My sister uh, used to be on the team with us and on the national team, and she recently retired, and uh, she now is a coach for a small youth club in uh, in the Upper Valley, and uh, I think she has a different relationship with skiing, but she still really enjoys it and uh, takes advantage of the what the ski world has to offer. So that's kind of, I think all of our goals are probably around there. Um, great question though, worth thinking about. With the World Cup coming to uh, the US, and so it's maybe coming there to here, what are some things you like to hear, or don't like to hear, or definitely noise enough on the sideline? <laughs> great question, that's definitely noise question. is always a good start. <laughs> never, never fails, but uh, yeah, we like, it's always fun to be cheered for by name, you know? That's a tall order, but maybe in the homecoming World Cup, it could be arranged. Doesn't happen very often in Europe for a lot of us, but it's, uh, it's a real special feeling when it does. Like, sometimes in the middle of the race, someone will be like, oh, go Ben. And I'll be like, stop. <laughs> <laughs> you must be from Vermont. <laughs> you know, it's the only explanation. So stop. hopefully in Minneapolis, we'll hear a lot of that and it won't be quite so out of the ordinary. But, yeah. So I the people are going, it's going to be great. Um, yeah. What is the average age of all of you? <laughs> well, let's see. We range from uh, Finn's... I'm going to bring it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, way to go, Finn. Finn's 16. 
No, you're 18, right? And then Jesse is 32. 32. So the average age is somewhere in the middle. I'm 23. I'm 25. You're 25. I'm 26. 26. Yeah, so in the, in the 20s, I would say. Yeah, Mackenzie. Oh, wait. So, oh, I, have, yeah, I have a question for you about <laughs> roller, <laughs> roller skiing has now become a sport itself in the summertime, and I'm wondering, you know, with races, I'm wondering if any of you have been part of that, or how you decide whether to participate in non-ski season racing in roller skiing or other sports. We just came back from a weekend of racing up in Lake Placid, which was really fun. Um, and I think a lot of us recognize that roller skiing is quite different from Nordic skiing. Thankfully. <laughs> um, and we loved putting on a bib and like getting our mindset into like race mode throughout the year so it doesn't feel like you go to November and you're like, whoa, <laughs> I haven't been like in that mental gear of racing, racing, because it is, you know, different than an interval session in a lot of ways. So I think we try to do frequent, but not too frequent, because we do also need a like a little bit of a a break from the like mental side of racing because it is quite taxing to go from November to basically the end of March when you're racing every weekend. So we try to find a balance where we, we get to put on a bib, you know, a handful of times. Um, and I know that Ben jumped in some roller ski racing in Europe. And then I also jumped in a roller ski race and I was in France and it was a really cool experience. I think, um, I'm not going to be joining the world cup racing for roller skiing anytime soon, but maybe you guys want to speak on that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really um, cool alternative to cross-country skiing, and it's they put on a great performance in Europe, and it's a really think, fun thing, and we've done some time trials around here, too, and I think it's, it's awesome getting people together and racing, and it's another, it was amazing seeing the whole New England ski community this weekend again, and brings people together but yeah I think a balance of everything is really fun. How do you manage such high volumes of training like throughout the whole year? Great question. Um, I think everyone approaches it differently and I think the keynote or the big takeaway I would say is that volume isn't everything and more isn't always better. I'm a really big proponent of quality over quantity and um, volume may depend on a person. Like Jesse and I train a lot together, but we train different volumes. And there's no right or wrong way. Um, but when the volume is really high, that means really focusing on recovery. So when the volume's really high, I try to be off my feet, um, sleep a lot, make sure I'm eating enough. When the volume's really high, it's really hard to eat enough. Like sometimes your appetite is suppressed. And so you have to just be a little bit mindful. Am I getting the energy that my body needs for all that volume? And recognizing too, if you're training a lot of volume to absorb that and get the benefit from that, you're gonna have to have an easy week. And so building in those periods of training where you're training really hard, but you're also recovering mentally and physically. That's awesome. Definitely. Great question. What does training look like for you guys day to day? Like what would you do kind of on average in a day or a week? Yeah. yeah, so usual day of training for us is um, usually two workouts, and our first workout is usually around 8.30, 9. Um, most of the time, six days out of the week, we are all training together, <laughs> which is fun. Um, and the morning training session is anywhere between an hour and a half to two, two and a half. And then we come back and are pretty good about getting a good lunch in us. Um, and then putting our feet up and resting <laughs> until our second workout, which is usually around three or four, um, which another hour and a half to two hours. And then dinner, which right after that workout, important with, you know, fuel. Um, and then <laughs> honestly off to bed. <laughs> um, but there's obviously a lot more things that we do in between. Um, but that fluctuates from week to week. Sometimes we are only training eight to 10 hours and sometimes we are up around 30 hours. Um, so our training definitely fluctuates um, week to week and month to month. So good question. Oh my God. 
the question I have is, before a race, are you allowed to familiarize yourself with the course so you know where everything is? And another thing is, is there such a technique as getting a run for the hill? To make sure you go go over the, the, the short upgrade without stalling, so to say. Thank you. So I'm going to let Ben take that because he's probably the best run over the hill guy in the world right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we definitely do preview the courses big time. And uh, sometimes it's even two, one or two days before uh, where we ski both, both days on the course. And yeah, we all have strengths in different places. And uh, yeah, when we preview the courses, that's when we determine, you know, where our chance, our best chances are to capitalize. So yeah, like she was saying, for me, it, it oftentimes comes on, uh, on the hills. And you definitely need to get some speed up before, because if you come in, you're going slow at the bottom of the hill, it's hard to be going anything other than slow at the top of the hill. So uh, yeah, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a big part of what we do, especially when we race a lot every weekend. It's kind of got to get out there and check out the course and go up those hills. <laughs> Great question though. So this is everyone, this is their day off. So part of how we're gonna support them is letting them get home to bed soon, okay? And off their feet. But what I wanna do is I have one question here that's left over and I wanna ask, see if there's two more people out there with questions. Got one and two. Okay, sorry, if you were slow. <laughs> okay. Oh wait, three. She grabbed, we're going three. I, I'm sorry, we're negotiating. Okay, have you ever woken up on race morning and really just didn't want to race? Yeah, definitely. That, um, that happens every once in a while. Um, sometimes you had a bad race the day before or you slept horribly, and that definitely happens. Um, I can think of an instance where that happened to me this year, and uh, you know, you're always sort of caught with a, with a tricky tricky question on your hands of whether or not you sort of push through it and go out and race or if you listen to maybe if you're getting sick or tired or something um and it's always hard for sure but uh, i you know have found that if you wake up and feel like you really don't want to race but it's just something in your head it can actually be really rewarding to just go out and do it and and practice what jesse was talking about earlier where you just do the race you execute your plan you don't look at the results you don't worry about that and you just say okay you know <clears throat> did i make myself better in some capacity today and you almost always do, even if it was a horrible race, you know, so, and you can say, well, hey, I woke up and I didn't want to do it and I did it. So, that, you know, that makes me a better guy. Um, but yeah, that happens for sure. I mean, that's the reality of just being, being alive. <laughs> Big time. Um, do you want to, oh, no, sorry. Two more questions after this. So specifically, Jesse, you've been such an inspiration for young girls, and I thank you for all the comments, all the statements, everything that you've posted. That's huge. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there a certain diet you could recommend for general training and recovery? Um, I could start with this. Um, so I think for, I can't speak for anyone other than myself. Um, but one of the biggest things that I learned from my time with the Emily program is that all foods fit into a healthy diet, right? So um, I don't want to eat hot dogs every day, but if I'm camping or a, the, or a Red Sox game and I want to have one, that's great. I also don't want to eat carrots for every meal. That's equally as bad for me if that's all I have, right? And so I think just being able to have some flexibility and enjoy the birthday cake celebrations with people, but also make sure that when I build a plate, as Julia mentioned, like that's pretty much how I tend to eat. Like I wanna make sure it's colorful. I want it to be fresh and local if that's possible. I also recognize that that can be a privilege to be able to buy fresh, local and organic. Not everyone has that opportunity all the time. Um, but I wanna make sure I'm getting a variety of foods and um, eating seasonally and just getting lots of carbs, protein, fruit, veggies, nuts, seeds. I pretty much eat all of that. So <laughs> that's what I aim for. Ice cream, though. Definitely yeah, ice cream. definitely that. And I, I have some lactose intolerance, but they make it in every, every kind of nut milk now, so it's great. She's very humble. Jesse makes the most amazing cakes, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's all baked good. It's all baked good. <laughs> 
they are very good cakes. <laughs> I have some. <laughs> um, Thank you. So I've noticed we have a lot of younger racers in the house tonight. Um, lots of high schoolers and maybe some middle schoolers I've seen. Is there anything that comes to mind for any of you like that if you could go back to your high school self when you're racing, what you might, you know, impart some wisdom on yourself? <laughs> Enjoy it. Have fun uh, and savor it. Don't take it too seriously. You're young and I'm young too. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're young. Do, do a lot of stuff. You know, keep yourself busy with a lot of stuff other than skiing because you'll have plenty of time to be a professional skier if you choose to do that. So don't worry about it. Yeah, good, that's a good point. I would definitely try to tell myself to practice pacing more. <laughs> so I don't have to be dealing with that now. <laughs> Great question though. Thanks for Kenzie. Thank you all for coming. What's on? Thank you. Thank you.